Hi, I'm Chris the Counselor and today we're going to look at my top five tips for making the most of your counselling training. So in this video I'm going to focus on diploma and degree level. Um, some of these may be relevant for earlier stages but I think the diploma and the degree are probably the most essential to have some guidelines in terms of making the most of your training. So, the first tip that I have is to embrace the process. Uh, that's probably a phrase you might get sick of during your counselling training, you're probably going to hear it a lot. Trust the process, embrace the process, the word journey will come up a lot. But during your training, embracing the process, particularly in the group, is really important. From the minute that you enter the room on the first week, you are going to be getting data from your fellow students in terms of how they impact on you, your feelings that you have in response to them, do you like them, do you not like them, what are your prejudgments about the people in the room. You are getting data all the time that you are in the classroom. And this is really essential information for your work as a counsellor. What this data is telling us is what our triggers are, what our preconceptions are, what our judgments are, all these types of things and they're very important to working through these and also being aware of them during your counselling training. So pay attention to all the data that comes up, all the reactions that come up, all the feelings that come up and use these to try and gain self-awareness and self-insight during your counselling training. I would also say to take some risks. You're going to probably have a lot of opportunity to explore these reactions in the bigger group. So for example, you will have process groups or sometimes they're called PPD or encounter groups. And these are times when you might have the opportunity to share these reactions with other people. I think what's important about this is you can often see the other person's reaction and this will help you work out what is yours, what is theirs. It might also help you see that you can work through those difficulties. And I would say most importantly, how your feeling towards other people changes when you gain understanding about them. So in summary, pay attention to everything that goes on inside you during your counselling training take some risks and use all the data that you can to build self-awareness and gain self-reflection. Okay, number two is to find a good therapist. So as part of your counselling training, um, nearly all counselling training, it's pretty much essential that you have a therapist throughout the entirety of the course. This is done for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is so you can experience being a client. The other is so that you can work through things that might be helpful for your work as a counsellor. And also there's going to be a lot of things that are coming up from week to week on the course that you might want to take to a confidential setting to be able to talk those through. A lot of the times your group contract will stop you talking about things that go on in the group outside of the group. But therapy is a great place to be able to do this. Obviously there will usually be a lot of choice in terms of therapists in your area. It's not always the case, but more often than not, there will be a wide selection of choice of therapists in your area. So the one thing that I would say is shop around. Find the right therapist for you. Make the most of the free sessions that most people offer as an initial session with your therapist. These are really good ways of getting a feel for your therapist and deciding if they are the right person to work with during your counselling process. The other thing I would say is trust your gut with the therapist. You might feel that you might not know enough to choose a therapist or you're unsure if you're making the right decision. But again, as I was saying in point one, listen to your own reactions. If you think, yes, this is someone that I feel comfortable with, that I can speak openly with, that I trust, then I would listen to that and maybe working with that therapist would be a good idea. Otherwise, if you see a therapist where you think, I don't feel too comfortable, there's something not quite right about this person, or it just doesn't feel right to me, listen to that too. It might not always be right, but I think your gut is often right, particularly in encounters in relationships with other people. So pay attention to what you're feeling when you meet your therapist and trust your gut in your encounter with them. 
The other things that might be worth consideration, there's kind of two different areas. The first is whether you change therapist halfway through the course. So some people will stick with the same therapist for two years. Sometimes people might change halfway through the course, so after the first year. Of course, some people change more often than this as well. But generally speaking, people will stick with the same therapist for two years, or they will have one therapist in the first year, one therapist in the second year. I think there's arguments for both of these. If you stick with the same therapist, obviously you can build a relationship. It stops you having to go through that process again with someone new, and they know you very well. The argument for going with a new therapist is you get a different experience with a different person. Um, it can be very easy, particularly if you've only had one therapist, to feel like that is how therapy works. But actually, like all therapy, that will be very much to do with what type of person that is and what they bring to the therapeutic space. So having different therapists means you get different experiences of how counsellors will approach therapy in different ways. What are the commonalities? What are the differences? So sometimes this can be a good idea to get different experiences. The other thing that's related to this is whether you should see a therapist that matches the approach that you're currently training in. Um, sometimes you might think that I have to go with a therapist with the approach that I'm training so I can get an experience of what that is like. Uh, and I think that's a really good argument. For example, if you're training to be a person-centered therapist, then I think it's probably a good idea to be a client of a person-centered therapist because then you can get a good insight into how that approach works in the other chair. It can also be said that it might be useful to experience other therapies for different reasons. If you want to explain those to clients, if you want to be able to get an insight in how different approaches would approach different problems, that could also be another reason for trying a different approach to what you're training in. So in summary, I would say it's really important to find a good therapist. Some of the most important work is going to happen here. Trust your gut when you're finding your therapist. And then there are debates around whether you should change halfway through or not, and whether you should see a therapist in the same approach that you're training in or not as well. Okay, on to the third point, which is placements. So, placements. Um, Placements, I know for most of my students, are the bane of their existence. They put so much effort into trying to find a placement, often unsuccessfully, um, and it's very hard work. You are contacting tens of agencies, a lot of which will not reply to your emails. Um, you don't know where you stand. Many will say that they you know, aren't taking on therapists or they only take people in the second year. You will come up against a lot of obstacles. So finding a placement is very, very hard. Because of this, the tendency can be to just go for the first placement that you find. Obviously, you just want any placement you can so that you can start building up your client hours. Um, this is understandable. What I would say, though, is to try and put more energy into the placements that fit what you are about and what you're looking for. For example, if you have a passion on a certain area of counselling, then really pursue the agencies that cover that area as well. They will hopefully see your passion come through and will hopefully give you more chance of getting a placement at that agency. But I would say that I would try and focus on the agencies that feel right for you. This might be your experience of just being in the agency and the team around the agency, or it might be the particular issue that they focus on. I think it's really important to pursue these because having a good experience of placement really changes your training experience. Um, the main reason for this is if you have a bad experience, if you're not supported and your placement is not helpful for you, this can be a very, very difficult stage of your training experience. So I'd really try and focus on finding a right placement for you, people that fit your values and the areas that you're interested in, and get to know the people there. I know for myself, I found my placement by just going into an agency on a Saturday and starting up a conversation. I think it 
helped that I was there in person, that I could have a conversation with them, and then I was successful in gaining the placement. So just look around where you live, go into agencies, start conversations, ask questions, and hopefully you'll find a really good placement for building your client hours during the course. So the fourth area to look at is supervision. So supervision is a really important part of just being a counsellor in general, but also your training process. Um, again, I would say it's quite similar to therapy in that I would really try and find a very good supervisor and someone that you trust and feel comfortable with. I know this isn't always the case because if you're working in an agency, sometimes the supervisor is supplied for you. But if you do have a choice either within the agency or you can find your own private supervision, then I would make the most of this. Again, I would shop around, I would have initial sessions, I would trust your gut on what feels right with a supervisor and what doesn't feel right with a supervisor. I think particularly as a trainee, it's really important that you feel comfortable with your supervisor. Supervision is going to be a place where you are taking the things that you've got wrong, the things you don't understand. It's a place you're going to be very vulnerable, much like therapy. So it's really important that you feel comfortable in that space, that you trust the supervisor, that you're able to talk openly with your supervisor. So very similar to what I was saying about therapy is to look around for the right supervisor or supervision group, trust your gut when you are meeting supervisors of what feels right and what doesn't, and try and stick it out to find the right supervisor because this will be essential in your training and ultimately the counsellor that you become. The other little note I just want to make on supervision is that I know for some people their experience has been very difficult because group supervision particularly may have other students on other courses who work in different ways. Um, this may be the same for the agency as well in that um, the agency might use a slightly different approach to what you're currently training on on your diploma and this can really clash. For example if you're really true to the person-centered values and this is how you want to practice as a counsellor it might be very hard to find a placement which is purely person-centered. For this reason, you might have to take placements which integrate other approaches which might not sit too well with you. And this can be a real challenge, particularly in supervision. If you are bringing your client work with your focus and your approach to it, you may be getting input from your supervisor or other trainees from their approach to counselling. And it might really clash with you and this can be difficult. I would say... If you do have to put up with this, then getting support from course mates, from your therapist, even from your course tutors or maybe group supervision that you do on your course is a great way to help you and support you through this. I would also say that you are completely in your entitlement to ask for a change of supervisor. A lot of the time as students, we can go and see supervisors and think, well, they must know what they're doing, they must be right, it must be my problem. This is not always the case. There are a lot of supervisors who I've heard as a tutor practice unethically, have made students feel unsafe, may not do things in the best way possible. So as I keep saying, I, again, I would trust your gut on this if it doesn't feel right with your supervisor, talk to your therapist, uh, talk to your tutors or course mates, and maybe you could change group or supervisor if you need to. Okay, and we get to the final point, which is basically around self-care. Um, obviously, you will see this a lot on your course. There will be hopefully covering a lot of areas around self-care, why it's important as a counsellor, what your self-care plan is, and why it's important just in day-to-day -day life. And I would say this is probably of the utmost importance whilst you're training to be a counsellor as well. Self-care is so important because I think the counselling diploma or degree particularly is very, very taxing. You are going to be going through some very different, uh, very difficult explorations within yourself. Um, it's going to be very taxing in terms of the workload, your placement, your personal therapy and all the demands that you have just on the course, never mind your personal life. So it's even more important to take care of yourself during this process as well. 
hopefully you will know ways in which you can do this and what works for you. But I think one way which is really helpful is to get a good balance. So it can be very easy to be completely immersed in counselling during the training and it can be an exciting time and something that we're really interested in. So this can be understandable. But I think it's also important to step out of this world sometimes as well. Do those hobbies that you enjoy, things that are completely unrelated to counselling that allow you to switch off your brain and engage a different part of yourself. So it's important to monitor yourself, pay attention to when you need support or when you might need to take a bit of a breather and be aware of the things that you do that will help you feel better within yourself, that help you recharge, that help you rejuvenate and try and do these as much as possible alongside the course as well. This will help you get through the course in a better state of mind and hopefully feel better within yourself as well. Another thing I would say on that is that a very common part of counselling training is that it completely changes lives. Um, although this sounds a good thing, it can also be a very difficult thing. Um, there is a reason that counselling diplomas are sometimes called divorce courses and this is basically because people are going on a journey of self-discovery. They are uncovering things that they did not know about themselves that have been locked away for years and years and understandably this can completely alter their personal relationships. So this is another element of the self-care part, is to be aware that probably your relationships in your personal life are going to be affected by this journey. That isn't to say it will always happen or that it's necessary or um, without doubt, but it's just to pay attention that as you change on the course, as you discover yourself more, you gain self-awareness and insight, it will invariably affect the relationships that you have out outside of the course as well. So just to be prepared for this and to be aware that this will probably be part of the process. The very last thing that I want to say about self-care is around the workload. Um, so obviously there's a huge workload as part of a diploma or a degree. You're going to be probably writing journals every week. You're going to have assignments as well as your placement and personal therapy, um, reading that you're gonna do away from the course. And the one thing I would say about that is just to try and stay on top of it, but at the same time to make sure you have support around that as well. Um, so it's important that you don't get too far behind because then there can be a lot to catch up on that can become very stressful, but equally you don't want to overdo it. The other thing that I'd say is there is often a lot of learning support that will be available wherever you're training. Um, this may be through the tutors, but more likely it's going to be in different departments of the college or university. And I would say make the most of these. If there are services there that can help you write your assignments, get your referencing right, whatever it might be, then I think it's really important to lean on these where you can to help you on your journey. This also goes for people in your personal life. Sometimes you might just want to ask someone to read over something or to give you a hand with your work, and this is fine. Um, but I think it's important to draw on these resources as much as possible, which will help us keep an even keel as we go through the course, and obviously the many demands that the course presents as well. So in summary of this one, I would just say to make sure you look after yourself, pay attention to those signs when things are getting a little bit out of balance and make sure you use the support that is available for you for your workload. I really hope that these five tips have been helpful in making the most out of your counselling training. If you're thinking of doing training or you're currently on training, then please leave a comment below. Let me know what your experience has been like, maybe what your fears are as you approach training, um, any tips that you would like to include that I haven't put in this video, um, and hopefully we'll meet other counselling trainees here as well and we can start discussions about that and help each other out as well. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so and thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. Thank you.